In India, a long heat wave has seen more than 60 people reportedly dying of heat stroke. India's large informal workforce is particularly vulnerable. Meanwhile, in China, at least 65 people have died after a week of torrential rain has battered the south of the country, triggering mudslides and flash floods. Weather forecasters have warned that the downpours will intensify this week. As we continue to report on extreme weather across the world, countries remain focused on finding ways to reduce carbon emissions. Today it was announced that the COP presidency and the International Energy Agency, the IEA, will convene a series of meetings ahead of the next COP summit in November to look at ways to transition to cleaner energy. Well, I'm pleased to say that to discuss this in more detail, I'm joined here in the studio by Fatih Birol, the chief executive of the International Energy Agency. Mr Birol was once named one of Time magazine's most influential people in the world and has been described by the US climate envoy John Kerry as an objective authority on what it takes to cut carbon emissions. Welcome to the studio, Mr. Birol. Um, first of all, you've announced this meeting later in the year ahead of COP. What are you hoping to achieve with that? Now, uh, when it comes to climate change, almost all the countries around the world are concerned and they want to find a solution to this uh, very problem. However, there are major differences between the countries, between North and the South, developing countries, developed countries, and we are, together with the COP29 presidency, bringing the uh, countries uh, together in an informal uh, setting and try to converge the views in order to get a strong outcome from COP29, as we did in COP28 in uh, Dubai. Now, you've released quite a lot of data about the transition to cleaner energy. Um, first of all, I was struck by one of your charts, which actually says that overall, countries are doing more when it comes to clean energy. And that's right. I mean, uh, when you look at the money, money tells everything. Uh, 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 2023, last year, of all the energy investments around the world, coal, oil, gas, clean energy, the entire budget of the global energy system was three trillion US dollars. One trillion went for fossil fuels and two trillion US dollars went to clean energy. This is very promising and it's a good way to go, but even this is not enough to bring the world in line with our uh, Paris climate goals, and which means with this trend, we are going to see a temperature increase about 2.5 degrees Celsius, which in turn will lead to uh, extreme weather events such as the ones you mentioned in China, India, but also in Middle East, we are seeing the same things, or in North America. Yeah, we've been reporting uh, in the last uh, few days and weeks about what's been going on in Mecca, the Hajj, exactly. of course, and indeed in yeah. North America as well. Do you think, therefore, then, if you're saying these goals won't be met, do you think they're unrealistic? Do you think that actually countries need to sit down and revise yeah. them? Now, in fact, the, the scientists tell us if we want to have a planet in the future, more or less like today, if you want to avoid the extreme weather events becoming much more frequent and much more intense, we have to find the ways to reduce the emissions. And energy sector is at the heart of it. The reason is very simple. More than 80% of the emissions causing climate change comes from the energy sector. Burning coal, burning oil, burning gas. I think instead of changing our target, we have to change the way we produce and consume energy, more clean energy and less fossil fuels. And I was also struck by some of your data, which shows that when it comes to transitioning, um, some countries are much better than others, particularly when you look at developing countries. Um, China's doing great, but otherwise, a lot of other nations are not. I think we see a lot of uh, investment going to clean energy in advanced economies and in China. They are doing more or less okay. But the problem is less attention, less money is going to emerging and developing countries. I mentioned $2 trillion for clean energy. 85% of this money uh, goes in the energy projects in advanced economies and in China. Only 15% goes in emerging and developing countries where two-thirds of the global population lives. So the, in my view, the fault line of our fight against climate change is 
how we are going to finance clean energy in emerging and developing countries. And how do we do that then? I think there are many ways uh, to do that. First of all, international financial institutions such as the World Bank, development banks need to help these countries and also the advanced economies need to be much more supportive for the emerging and developing countries because it is uh, leave aside the ethical reasons, leave aside the historical responsibilities just for egoistic reasons it is important for the advanced economies because emissions going to atmosphere from Jakarta or uh, uh, from New Delhi or from Detroit or from uh, uh, Liverpool it has the same effect on everybody emissions don't have a passport so to in order to save the even the developed countries advanced economies from the worst effects of climate change we have to find a solution to support the clean energy in emerging and developing countries. And you're someone at the top table, right? You meet yes. world leaders, yes. you go to these summits, yes. you've got a lot of praise from John Kerry about how yes. you negotiate with world leaders. But why is that message not coming through enough? Because targets aren't being met. I think, uh, first of all, I see that the clean energy is moving in the right direction, but not fast enough. The main problem today, what I see, is the fragmentation among the countries. The geopolitical fracturing among the countries is a major, major obstacle. And the second one is, as I mentioned, the uh, clean energy projects in emerging countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, they don't meet the international capital. We have to find a way to bridge this uh, gap, and this will be a good way to go out of this climate crisis. Let me move on to talk about another massive issue when it comes to energy, and that is, of course, uh, the fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine yes. and the energy challenges that have emerged since then. Um, your agency has done a lot of work around this. Yes, Just tell me more about that. Now, uh, I think, first of all, Europe made a major historical mistake when it comes to energy policies. Uh, Europe uh, energy was more or less a uh, big time was relying on one single country for oil and gas. About two thirds of the oil and gas was coming from one single country, even though it may be the most innocent country in the world. If you're your friendly country, you don't make this mistake. The, the magic word is diversification. And after the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Russia cut the uh, supplies and Europe was in a big, big, big uh, yeah, trouble. So you're obviously talking about U Europe's reliance on Russia exactly. for energy, and exactly. then the invasion of Ukraine happened. Yeah, yes. So and where the, do you see things now? Yeah. And what we see now is Europe, in fact, made a, a good job in the last two years. Uh, unlike some people uh, thought, Europeans didn't freeze and European economy did not collapse. Europe was able to go around this. But the, the, what we have to learn from that is don't rely on one single country when it comes to your energy. The second one is some people think more fossil fuels is good for energy security. It's not the case. Uh, we have understood in, in Europe that the using much more uh, renewable solar, wind or nuclear power helps to generate our domestic energy and less reliant on uh, the other countries. And do you think energy security then is one of the greatest challenges of our time then? Uh, uh, very much so. Energy security in terms of traditional forms, in uh, reliance, over-reliance on oil and gas, and the second one is uh, new energy security challenges are coming with the uh, increasing share of uh, renewables, increasing share of electric cars. There are some other challenges such as the critical minerals and critical supply chains. And here again, we shouldn't have to make the same mistake and rely on one single country. We shouldn't do the same. And there should be diversification of these critical minerals, where they come from and where they are processed. OK, thank you so much for joining me in the studio, uh, Fatih Birol, the head of the International Energy Agency.